So I think we can start. Um, welcome everyone to our Nature Investor Circle launch event on Web3 innovations within the context of nature markets. And if we uh, start on the first slide, Constantina. Great, thank you. So the Nature Investor Circle is an initiative launched by Nature Finance. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we're a Swiss-based non-for-profit organization committed to making nature count in global finance. Within this landscape, my colleagues and I engage in a wide range of activities at aligning finance with equitable and nature positive outcomes. We leverage our extensive networks and rely on a diverse range of partners for support. Working across different modalities of influencing has allowed us to become one of the leading voices in the nature finance nexus dialogue. And just to give you some context and which you can see on the slide, our focus areas to date have included working with the central banking community on nature and climate scenarios and law enforcement and financial regulators on the links between nature crimes and anti-money laundering. We, forced, we formed a, a successful task force on nature markets. We also host the sustainability link sovereign debt hub. And within this context, we launched a mission oriented early stage investment platform to support the innovation needed in this space. This includes our catalytic investment facility, which is a fund that makes early stage investments, as well as our nature investor circle, which supports early stage investors and nature positive ventures. We can change slides. So just to tune in to the right background music, I think everyone on this call here agree that we need a major shift in how nature is valued in global markets since our entire economy relies on it. And it also seems that market can't really value what they can't measure or rather need to and be perceived to measure. At the same time, with the growing popularity of nature markets, there's a real risk of negative outcomes due to pure, purely profit-driven investors. To tackle this, we need scalable and practical market and policy innovations that promote nature smart decisions. And early stage ventures are key in providing some of these, but they often face funding and alignment challenges. Next slide. And that is why we set up the Nature Investor Circle to champion this transformative shift. We believe that early stage investment is a sweet spot and a great way of catalyzing rapid shifts, aligning with the urgency for change. Where this type of investment can have the greatest impact is in creating markets and tools we need, making them accessible, transparent, and paving the way for broader participation. And by crowding in like-minded people and collectively pursuing investments under an aligned agenda, we feel this approach can serve as an effective and inclusive in-market advocacy strategy to help shape the nature markets that we need. Next slide, please. So in this journey, we're grateful to our founding partners, which you can see here on the slide, who share our commitment to building an ecosystem of technical expertise and collaboration and to influence and increase the quantity and caliber of nature positive ventures receiving early stage financing. And this paper and event demonstrates how we share insights and expertise within our community. And if you'd like to join us, we are sharing the details towards the end of this presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Constantina, who authored the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Heba. Um, uh, it's nice to see many familiar faces in the audience and some new ones. Um, so we're very happy to announce that this morning we launched this new report titled The Rise of Web3, Nature's Potential in the Digital Age, 
which tries to identify strategies and opportunities for Web3 technologies within nature markets. And the reason we decided to launch this report and, and write it is because Web3 could potentially offer new approaches for nature markets that could have significant advantages that can be creative and generative. And simultaneously, we wanted to bring awareness and a critical view on how we should be developing these Web3 solutions. So we identified a number of opportunities and as a quick summary here, uh, firstly, of course, a data traceability, transparency and verifiability within a Web3 environment could ensure that funds contribute to nature and nature targets. Um, secondly, we know environmental data is an important part of this market and Web3 could unlock global decentralized data exchange platforms while also bringing new models for data ownership that don't exist currently. So, for example, allowing communities to own their environmental data and share when and how they want to. Thirdly, we could design mechanisms and practices to include indigenous peoples and local communities equitably. So, for instance, establishing transparency in land ownership and land use rights or documenting the full financial flow from investors to local people. Fourthly, we could design digitally enabled financing mechanisms such as uh, so that monitoring, reporting and verification of assets can be scrutinized by market participants and also drive price discovery based on differentiation factors. Fifth, Web3 technologies uh, stand to streamline several key cost and process areas and as a result could lower the threshold of participation in nature markets. And lastly, Web3 solutions could create more adaptive financing performance. And what we mean by that, for example, is that increased transparency could lead to a shift in capital flows to corporates that are able to showcase trusted data. And within this, we identified several areas in which Web3 can be applied to produce these opportunities. These are supply chain management, biodiversity credits, labeled KPI linked bonds, water trading and consumer nudging, um, especially through gaming. And as with any technology uh, and any Web3 solution applied to markets, we of course need to be careful uh, that the solutions do not replicate existing uh, unsustainable nature market dynamics, especially with recent challenges that we've encountered in the crypto world. Um, and simultaneously, we cannot overlook that we need appropriate governance structures to safeguard and protect market participants. There are several Web3 companies that are developing applications in these areas. And what is important here is to investigate both the application themselves, um, but also the underlying infrastructure that is being used to develop those applications in order to assess their potential to create equitable nature markets. You can find the report uh, online on the Nature Finance website. Um, and with this, I'm very happy to welcome our three speakers today. Um, they're developing very exciting solutions in this space. So first, we will hear from uh, Frederick Fournier from Open Forest Protocol, who is going to speak about the opportunities of a Web3-based MRV system for environmental assets. Then we're going to hear from Francisco Gomez uh, from Terrasos, who is going to speak about their collaboration with Regen Network on creating Web3-based biocredit market offerings. And last but not least, we will hear from Hania Offman from the HBAR Foundation, who is going to present the technical infrastructure that they are building for Web3 digital nature markets. Um, so yes, Fred, um, over to you. Thank you, Constantina. Hello, everyone. I'm Fred, the CEO and co-founder of Open Forest Protocol. Uh, and I'm here to present why we have built Open Forest Protocol and, and what is Open Forest Protocol. So when we look at the, at the high level, uh, next slide, please. 
um, we all know that, of course, the carbon credit market and mostly the VCM is going to increase uh, importantly in the next 20, 30 years from now. Uh, yet we don't really have the good framework for market participants, especially for uh, people more in the global south or people that don't have access to the market or technology to, to do so. Um, so Open Forest Protocol basically uh, address a problem in the market on uh, basically exclusivity, expense, the expensiveness of access in the market and the opaqueness. <clears throat> it means that for projects developing um, nature-based solution as a whole, but in, in our case, restoration of forest, uh, reforestation, afforestation, uh, or agroforestry, uh, most of the of the the market participants uh, are for for the moment excluded, uh, and we are trying to address that. Next slide, please. So the way we do this at Open Forest Protocol is to address this with a data backed approach, uh, and a data backed approach that is fully transparent to every uh, to everyone. Uh, to basically uh, use this data approach to create value in the form of common credits. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the next slide, I'm gonna present how this work in, uh, in the Web3 environment. But first, the, the, the value proposition and the key elements of what we have developed are basically proposing accessibility uh, to projects that are most of them bigger projects, but for projects that are not able to access the market today, uh, below 1,000 hectares. Um, we propose that to do that in a speedy manner so they don't spend too much time uh, to access um, the market in a cost efficient way where there is no upfront cost for the project and they receive most of the value, in our case 85%, uh, in a fully transparent manner. And you'll see how we will do that in the next slides. Um, and the consequence of that is with this approach, we end up with higher quality and uh, scalability. Next slide, please. So here on the screen, you'll have the steps of how we value and how we work with, with data, um, which you will see is a data loop. Um, so, and we have developed a product, a specific product for each of those steps. So let's imagine you're a project in, in Africa, you want to, um, to restore forest or do some agroforestry within a cocoa plantation. Uh, you can come to us to open forest protocol and basically the first step here is to onboard your project. So describing your project within our dashboard. Um, and this is the step where the metadata of the project is um, entered in the, in, in, the, in the dashboard. All of the data that you will see here will be then end up on blockchain in different, you know, different ways. Uh, here it's in the first step, it's an NFT. So I won't go into the too many details, but meaning that at, at, at the time you enter uh, the process, your data, and of course, the, the data coming from, uh, from the monitoring mostly is gonna be available. Next slide, please. So once a product is onboarded, that we have checked the, you know, the eligibility criteria of a project towards carbon, um, eligibility, meaning additionality, leakage, permanence, they have access to a second product, which is an app we have developed for any smartphone they can use and they will have to use to collect data in specific plots, what we call sample plots in the forest uh, in a very specific manner. Um, and this is basically the, the framework in which the project will operate, meaning that it's their task to gather data uh, on a recurring basis uh, every year um, coming from their project. Next slide, please. The third step of the data. Uh, oh yeah, you have a, here a, a presentation of on the left side, the dashboard and on the right side, uh, the mobile app used uh, in a project in Guatemala. Next slide, please. Uh, the third step, which is probably the most innovative part of what we have built is the data verification process. So in here, um, what happens is once the project has uploaded data, has double checked its data, they will send it for validation. Validation with Open Forest Protocol means that there's a community of validators, meaning multiple dozens of companies that are knowledgeable about forests. Some are uh, remote sensing companies, some are forestry 
consultants, some are VVBs, uh, and their role uh, is to basically check the data that is uploaded and do a check. So is there accept the data set or deny the data set that is uploaded from the project? Uh, and this is a private communal vote um, that is then showed uh, once the, the timeline is, uh, is, is over, showed uh, as a result. The data has been, has been accepted or denied by the community. If it's been accepted, then the data can be used for further um, uh, calculation, specifically carbon uh, credit accounting, uh, no, creation and then accounting. Next slide, please. So here you have a view on, on the validator dashboard that every validator has access to. Uh, they, have, they have a list of basically the projects uh, they need to check uh, and accept or deny and the, time, the timeline they have for every, uh, every project. Next slide, please. The fourth step uh, is basically the value creation. So given a project has uploaded data, uh, has been accepted um, for the data upload, then we, we the, the, the smart contracts in the back end will calculate the amount of carbon that has been stored by the, the, the forest uh, between the last data upload and the current data upload, meaning a year, um, and will mint the current spending amount of carbon credits and send that uh, those carbon credits to the wallet of the project. Next slide, please. Um, so that's a view of the wallet. We can go to the next two. And finally, all of this, uh, the data that has been collected, the verification process, if it was accepted or not, the carbon credits minted, all of that data uh, and, and the carbon credits are transparently displayed uh, on our map interface called the ecosystem atlas that everyone can access uh, to, to have an idea of what's happening and, and basically make up her, his mind or her mind uh, on, on the validity of what's happening in, the, in a specific project. Um, so this is basically the data loop that we have built. All the data is then on blockchain for being immutable and transparent. And more importantly, the asset creation in the form of common credits here uh, is then also, is also possible to be tracked, meaning that if a company or someone will buy those common credits and use them for offset, uh, for, ex for instance, uh, they will be basically burned or used in a blockchain. So they, there is no double accounting possible. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so please have a look at our Atlas. Um, you can access it through our, through our website. Uh, we have currently more than 80 projects on the platform uh, and many more in the pipeline. Next slide, please. So if I do kind of a summary of where we, where we are in the, in, in the value chain, um, we are a player that is basically connecting the projects to the investors or the buyers of carbon credits through a single platform uh, with this decentralized validation approach where it's not us uh, validating the data, it's a community of companies validating the data. Um, so we play this role of uh, the connector end-to-end uh, -end from project to, to investor. Next slide, please. Um, what's very important for us to be successful is that we are building not a private company, we're building a network, uh, an ecosystem of different players, different uh, stakeholders. Of course, we have the projects on one side, we have the validators, and we have a few ones uh, sitting here, uh, we have some contributors, but, but we also are working with uh, many other uh, actors, uh, marketplaces, governments, um, basically, this platform is is been built as its core for making sure everyone knows about the rules, which are the rules, uh, to have the rules transparent, and to improve the rules together if we want to improve them, which obviously we will over time. Next slide, please. Um, for building this, we've been we spent about three years with a diverse team. I won't go too much into details, but we have people from the blockchain, people from the climate space. Uh, people linked to operations and projects. Uh, so it's it's big melting pot of people coming from different uh, backgrounds. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more, uh, please uh, contact us or join us in this uh, in this in this endeavor and uh, contact uh, contact us through the website or have a look at the uh, at the interface. And I'm very happy to take some questions now. Thank you.
Thank you, Fred. Um, so I did forget to say before I introduced you that we're going to have the Q&A after all the presentations. So uh, I'd actually invite everyone that is in the audience to send their questions in the chat because our team are collecting them. Uh, and then we're going to uh, use them for the conversation afterwards. Um, thank you very much, Fred. Very interesting. Very interesting to see that you're also working in this ecosystem approach. Um, and now we are, I invite Francisco, uh, if he can open, if he can turn on his camera um, and I'll pass on the microphone. Thank you, Constantina. And thank you, Fred, for opening the way. Um, okay, so I'm I'm Francisco Gomez. I'm I'm the CEO the COO sorry at at Terrazos. Um, we we basically work towards creating exceptional projects um, that protect highly threatened ecosystems. That's um, our focus. Next slide, Constantina, please. Um, we do it uh, basically with uh, three main business models, one advisory and consultancy work um, around, uh, well, conservation projects, but, but mostly uh, around compliance uh, in the in the Colombian environment sector. Um, we also have a line uh, of work where we design investment portfolios uh, in biodiversity. And the last one, which we'll be talking about more today uh, is basically the habitat banks and conservation areas um, that we structure and operate um, both for the compliance market and for voluntary markets. Um, next slide. This is just um, some of the partners and, and clients that we have. Um, nothing very important here, uh, just the fact that um, we not only work with the private sector, uh, but we try to incorporate all of our uh, knowledge creation with governments, with uh, um, aid uh, agencies like, like USAID or, or Partnership for Forest and with IDB, uh, which is one of our, um, let's say, more strategic partners. Uh, next slide. And OK, so so you've I think you've seen this slide many times before, but basically this is this is the challenge that we face. Um, and uh, specifically in Latin America, we we're one of the most vulnerable areas in the world um, because of our high rates of, of biodiversity. Um, so our, our proposal, um, next slide, Constantine. Um, is basically that we work with what we call habitat banks. Um, the idea being that we aggregate uh, possible investments in the territories around uh, biodiversity and uh, restoration and preservation activities. Um, the the habitat banks uh, as a as a mechanism in Colombia um, has been. Uh, structured in uh, the environmental regulation so that companies that uh, require an environmental license and eventually have to to compensate the residual impacts um, can use habitat banks as as their mechanism um, it's been going on for for almost 10 years and uh, it creates uh, a lot of benefits not only for the companies that um, in 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 terms of a, a performance based mechanism, they they have like a turnkey project for all of their environmental obligations. Um, but it also works very well for um, the environmental authorities, uh, which basically feel uh, that the um, quality of all projects being executed in territories uh, has risen just because. Uh, you have the aggregated um, execution or operation through a habitat bank. Um, next slide. How how it works is that basically we um, structure the projects 
before the obligations come online. Uh, so you actually have all the legal, all the technical, and all the, um, let's say, uh, financial uh, activities um, registered through the environmental authorities before projects come online. Um, the market is actually very well analyzed because it's completely transparent, being uh, it comes from the from the compliance sector, um, and the um, all of the all of the baseline and implementation activities are um, registered at the Ministry of Environment, and they're the ones that actually um, guarantee that all of the information. Uh, is is up to date and is transparent for all um, actors. Um, what we do is that when when companies arrive with a with a compensation plan, um, we basically take that compensation plan and start operating it um, we, we, with uh, the environmental authority that that's the one that's going to approve their plan. And um, and when doing that, now once once we we comply. Uh, with the different milestones, um, then the the project actually gets paid by the company. So it's a it's a pay for success model. Um, the idea is that these projects operate on a on a thirty year plan. Um, most of the compliance activities uh, operate only on a on a five uh, to fifteen uh, year spectrum. Um, so most um, projects can can actually operate their their compensations through habitat banks um why have i spoken about this because this was basically the the way uh in which we started the company 10 years ago um next slide um now we are actually working towards building what would be um the market for the voluntary uh, credits. Um, so, with a, with our experience in the compliance market, we we structured a, a protocol which basically sets the rules and the methodology for um, determining how uh, a project could actually issue voluntary biodiversity credits. Um, it, it basically has four main factors: um, the the threat category of of the ecosystem that you're working, in, the opportunities for connectivity. Um, how, how much um, the project will last, the, the, the project duration or permanence, and whether you're doing preservation or restoration activities. Next slide. Um, this, this approach um, results in an in a area-based unit for biodiversity, um, which for us represents 10 square meters for each credit. The idea is that with the um, with the uh, structuring of of the project, um, you can actually demonstrate biodiversity gains um, by um, scheduling uh, milestones, both ecological milestones and um, management milestones, um, and this will uh, basically result in. Uh, projects that uh, are high integrity um, and that comply with the principles that we've set out uh, regarding traceability, continuity, rigor, applicability, additionality, and complementarity. Um, this, these credits um, were were basically um, our idea of of how we could actually scale uh, our. Uh, success in in the compliance market, but throughout the world, and um, and then thinking about those those principles is basically where we landed um, to well in in in, in Web three um, scenario um, specifically uh, around traceability, uh, transparency, and uh, verifiability. Um, so next slide, please. Because our our projects are are based on on a credit release, um, and because we we need uh, for the projects to be performance based, then all of the work that we do for the um, issuance of the credits, uh, they need to 
um, comply with what we've said uh, at the beginning of, of project structuring um, and what we've said um, when the projects are being registered. Um, next slide, please. So when you when you understand the the the, the value chain of the project, you have um, of course the the project developers, which which in our case is is the Razos. We we're the ones that coordinate investors and communities or landowners uh, towards this goal of producing high integrity projects. Um, we in 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 this value chain um, we have. Two independent parties around the auditors um, that that need to verify and validate that everything that's being done uh, through registration documents and through uh, the um, compliance of of the projects is is actually online. Um, but there's the registration platform which basically hosts the projects and is a key player in in issuing the the credits and in keeping that um, count accountability of of um, of which credits are being issued how they're being sold and to whom they're being sold to um, so next slide please and and in doing so the idea is that we understood the the importance of um, registry as a process um, and not just as a service for the for the for the projects um and and this is how how we started um working with with region and and how we started uh, thinking about web three um in terms of achieving that promise of high integrity projects next slide please um so our our now our, our vision towards the the voluntary biodiversity credit market um basically creating robust methodologies um, that are comparable with those uh, required for achieving high integrity uh, credits. Um, of course, we have a, an international agenda where, where this needs to be discussed and where we can actually achieve um, a minimum in terms of those standards around high integrity. Um, we're creating use cases and one of our, our flagship projects right now, it's working with um with Asoka San, they're, they're called the uh, um, Consejo Comunitario Mayor del Alto San Juan, which is basically a, a community in the Pacific coast of Colombia. Um, they have community owned land. And the idea for us is to show uh, a project that can be built with the community um, where they're not just beneficiaries of a project, but where, where they actually own the project. Um, and when when you think about like the the range of possible projects you now with with like one side the just a, a landowner and the other side you now community land where you have thousands of families living there um the idea of of ownership of the project and of ownership of the data um becomes really important in terms of of the governance structure to design that project um we're also working on other use cases like green treasury bonds and, and financial obligations um, for development projects. Um, and then, of course, thinking about traceability, transparency, and immutability, uh, trying to link those principles of our methodology to the different use cases is basically where, where, we, where we stand right now um, and where we've uh, structured um, uh, um, Let's say like a like a roadmap for uh, achieving um, this this process. Next slide. Thanks, Francisco. Just two minutes um, left. Okay. Um. So, this is basically the the idea of of linking the credits to to tokens to non fungible tokens as as the possibility of creating that immutability. Um, of issuing units of the highest integrity and trying to guarantee uh, to investors, to landowners, to communities and to buyers uh, that the whole uh, process of structuring those credits um, is of the highest qualities and with the highest guarantees. 
Um, next slide. The idea being that we want to take advantage of um, this uh, framework that's becoming Web3, uh, where we can actually have uh, environmental data ownership while achieving um, robust governance designs that allow for uh, our projects and the projects uh, that we work with uh, with our communities um, to be completely transparent uh, and to be able to uh, um, to have the the whole history of the project uh, on a specific ledger where this can be verified by um, both uh, the verification and validation bodies but also any other entity uh, that requires it next slide and we see uh, a whole lot of benefits in doing so, not just for us and for the communities, uh, but for the standards and protocols that are um, emerging uh, in terms of this clear uh, path and clear rules around integrity. Um, of course, the you know, the role of, of registries um, and, of course, the, the alignment they need to have with validation and verification bodies um, for full uh, traceability of information. Um, and for buyers, um, where they can actually guarantee that everything they're they're buying is is properly done, um, is has been created as planned in the registration documents. Next slide. This is basically what we want to avoid. Um, I, I think you've you've seen it uh, already, uh, and it's not. Um, something that we um, we want for this new market of, of biodiversity credits to um, to be able to 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 have so so we want to you know, understand and learn from from the the mistakes uh, made in the in the carbon market um, next slide and finally this is this is something that we that we think um, this market needs. Uh, in terms of uh, the infrastructure and the governance that's required for full transparency and accountability um, and what that means um, when we when we think about market build, building um, the accreditations for validation and verification bodies but also for registry platforms and how they can be part uh, of the accountability for the projects um, of course we we need the um, commitments by buyers, by uh, visionaries, uh, and we need uh, for this to be community-centered. We need communities to get involved, um, of course, with embedded safeguards, but also uh, communities that actually feel uh, these projects develop their communities um, and, and are a source of income um, for them. Um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, nice to hear from a non-Web3 uh, initiative. And now I'll pass on to Hania. Thank you, Constantina. And uh, thank you for the task force for inviting us and engaging with us here. So it's always great uh, to be here and great to be here with Fred and Francisco. My name is Hani Hofman. I am uh, the Director of Sustainable Impact um, EMEA at the HBAR Foundation Sustainable Impact Fund. So today I'll be sharing a bit more about um, how we think and how we're operating on enabling nature's balance sheet. And we'll be doing this through um, shining a bit more light on building auditable accounting systems and where we build upon the lessons that we have learned from uh, the climate markets, um, uh, carbon markets, and overall sustainability focused markets. Next slide, please. So to give you a bit more background about the HBAR Foundation, um, so we focus on bringing the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. You might have heard this before. And um, this begins with supporting builders um, that grow the sustainability economy on Hedera. So we focus on key enabling infrastructure that has historically been missing in the market 
and we financially support um, its maturity. But we also make it possible to deliver uh, use cases, usually world-changing use cases with large organizations that weren't uh, possible before, uh, simply because it requires a significant investment in order to make these horizontal infrastructures and vertical as well. So our flagship piece of infrastructure that we have invested in um, is called the Hedera Guardian. This is a great example of um, where, for example, our investment has not only facilitated the development of a policy workflow engine, as we call it, but also paved the way for the creation of um, digital monitoring, reporting, and verification digitization tool. So this tool, what this does, it allows us to digitize policy rules um, and it seamlessly collects MRV data according to those rules. And uh, this investment has led us to establish um, the world's largest library of digitized methodologies and open source uh, methodologies. And it's all powered by the Hedera Guardian. Next slide, please. So what do we do in the Hedera Guardian ecosystem? Uh, so we invest um, in a overall ecosystem that is built in um, principles in climate and nature markets on Hedera. So we leverage Hedera, uh, which is a layer one blockchain or hash graph technology as our balance sheet. And we leverage it not just for assets like a metric ton or a megawatt hour in the case of a REC or an offset, we do this inclusive of our climate and biodiversity or nature oriented rule sets, data and, and finance. And we implement our five goals, which I will tell you more about in a bit. So we provide digital infrastructure. We enable the building of the applications on the digital infrastructure and we implement these applications to impact communities at scale. Next slide, please. So where we sit, um, as the HBAR Foundation, uh, we act as the coordinator uh, for making um, this community uh, strategic investments in the, in, in the enabling digital levers. So therefore we start enabling our planet's balance sheets. We focus on projects um, that are auditable, that turn data into human understandable information um, that facilitate markets based upon real change following um, scientific principles um, and our five goals. So we build using open source infrastructure, which is mapped to our investment thesis, and we provide surrounding supports on this um, through our partners. So for example, support like academic fellowships, hackathons, community education. Um, and we do this in a partnership with, uh, for example, the DLT Earth um, Initiative, and with our partnership with Swords Labs. Swords Labs provide us wrap around supports um, and technical guidance in terms of adopting this infrastructure at absolutely no cost to the community. And it's completely aligned with our principles and five goals. Next slide, please. So what are our five goals? First of all, our five goals are here to enable our mission in order to bring uh, the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. And they're focused on first goal is making climate finance auditable. We wanna understand where capital comes from and where it goes. Um, for example, if a bond, a carbon forward or any other debt asset is issued, we wanna see who's actually paid and what they do with those funds um, and on the public network, um, such as utilizing stable coins, um, we can start seeing that and start really implementing this form of traceability at this granular level. This leads us to our second goal of digitizing and open sourcing methodologies. So to date, the Hedera Guardian ecosystem has digitized the largest volume of open source methodologies in the world, as mentioned before. So we've collectively taken a process that often took months or even years to build a platform or a digital system with significant costs attached to it and brought it down to weeks and just a fraction of the cost in order to digitize the methodologies. So an example, um, in our latest hackathon together with DLT Earth, we had about 700 registrants uh, that signed up um, in order to digitize methodologies. 
um, and they contributed to the growth of this library. But what's important is that these rule sets operate on a public ledger. They provide a connected workflow, uh, connected workflow of rules um, or a policy workflow engine, as we call it. And they ha all have actors who have accounts on Hedera that are able to attest the information um, in the context of these rules. So everybody is included in that. So all of these connected data points um, come from multiple sources um, and they complete the required data within the methodology, which can then be independently <clears throat> validated for proper collection within the rule sets that we have agreed upon. So this leads us to our third goal, which is uh, requires the scaling of validation and verification. The pro and to scale the process both in the digital form, but also in terms of where the projects reside. So for, for us, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, that where the projects are actually based, that there's not a lot of validation and verification bodies, and that you need to fly in or contract with a global north counterpart, um, often at a premium rate, um, uh, in order to collect the data that local people can collect as well. Um, in addition, also from a financial flow perspective, it is, you know, we start enabling building capacity in places, um, specifically where sustainable development is required. So this feeds us into creating um, um, assets um, that have a price based upon this type of data, this type of data benefit, benefit share and capacity building having a broader impact than just the initial climate or nature impact. Our goal of discovering a global climate or nature asset price. So we focus on finding prices based upon the real attributes that are attached to the projects. Um, these assets, when these assets are bought, um, they need to sit um, um, on our companies, countries, and personal balance sheets with their corresponding liabilities, all connected to, for example, reaching net zero, nature positive, or any other outcome that we have identified as being um, relevant. Next slide, please. When it, when it comes to connecting or applying our goals to the ecosystem, um, we build in a interconnected infrastructure and surrounding the Guardian. So we provide building blocks and context to data and information. And then the applications build and leverage um, both the technical and scientific standards. They then all start speaking the same language which facilitates the workflows. These workflows are financial workflows. They provide transparency into the assets following these methodologies or the creation of the assets through the guardian supported registry processes. So standards are implemented and biodiversity credits, uh, as an example, are an output. So for people looking at things from a corporate perspective, um, this could mean that we enable uh, guardian enabled TNFD workflows and methodologies are devi defined and integrations to the market are facilitated to purchase these biodiversity credits um, connected directly to their liabilities um, in the market. Next slide, please. What this does then, we've now talked about the infrastructure. So what this does then, it enables dozens of community members and grantees. Uh, to accelerate building their applications um, and enables them to work um, with the communities using their enabled tools. who are often the catalyst of change in developing projects and making decisions on how to best tackle these challenges, right? So these people um, organizing and enabling projects often don't need to think of all the technical challenges to build digital tooling. Um, they don't need to focus on um, anything else but the environmental and um, the community impacts that um, um, they're trying to make. And all of these members start working together, and that's what we call the Hedera Guardian ecosystem. So it's really building from the ground up, reaching the communities. Um, then, next slide, please. Thank you. Just, just two minutes, Sonia. Yeah. So to bring this back to a market-facing view, this often looks like a series of financial um, instruments or applications. So communities are then able to receive support through funding for the upfront capital of a project. And these instruments often have activity metrics or gates and they need to pass to issue assets. Sometimes it's a project registration, um, a PIN or a PDD 
which then issues a forward, which then begins the process of getting validation after a rule set or a methodology is selected. Um, so the monitoring data is collected, verified ahead of an issuance uh, by a registry, and then the assets can be sold OTC um, as is common via any kind of um, uh, marketplace. Shown in the next slide, please. So shown in another way in the context of the biodiversity uh, credit markets, the um, uh, market supply can be funded by different instruments. The standards, although they are less mature at the moment than the carbon markets, they have an advantage and they can be digitized from day one with tools like the Hedera Guardian, and then can be compared to each other in order to improve the quality and have more quicker and better iterations of these policies rather than waiting through years of academic debate, for example, in journals. And these projects, which often have um, shifts or changes in their methodologies on a per project basis, cannot, can see not only their results, but market results focused on improved quality with their context based upon the attributes. Next slide, please. Oh, we can slip this, skip this slide and then go to slide number 11. So what is an attribute? Um, so an attribute is a quality uh, or a characteristic of a thing. And um, we focus on attribute-based um, uh, credits and attribute level kind of audit trail. So a category of attributes um, that we cover, uh, for example, are climate impact attributes, origination attributes, financial and transparency attributes, co-benefit attributes, and so on. Um, for each of these attributes, what is important is the attribute itself, uh, the coverage of the data, and the quality of the data, which we're, we'll be looking at. Next slide, please. Just 30, 30 seconds, Sonia. Yeah, I promise this last slide. When we look at the market, uh, we often see that we only included, and in general, we only include the base attributes. But with tools like the Guardian, what we do is um, uh, we enable the methodologies and data collection that is then clearly and digitally defined um, on the public balance sheet. And we can start enabling proper large use cases. Um, if we understand exactly how the data is collected uh, in a trusted way, we now have the ability to not just inspect and determine if we should trust our base attributes, but we can actually see the data behind them if it's truly coordinated with the outcomes that we're looking to have. So I think we can go to the last slide. You can skip this one. Skip this, this one. one. The last one, skip this one. Oh, the one before, sorry. So if you want to take an example um, of a project, we've been working on Article 6.2 project, and they've been building the first compost site in uh, partnership with um, Sonajet, which is a national waste company. The credits have initial investments by a fin financier, which is Carbon Growth Partners, and they have been enabling um, SDG-driven uh, impact across um, health and environmental um, action. But more importantly, we have really clear social impacts and economic impacts. And Alcott is currently in the process, which is our partner and our main guarantee um, of digitizing this methodology and bringing it to the public ledger. We have full financial transparency on these types of projects. So what we're trying to get to is having these kind of attributes with full transparency on a public ledger and enabling builders to build um, solutions on top of that. So this is the end. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Hania. Um, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, if Fred, uh, Hania and Francisco can keep their uh, cameras on, that would be great. Um, I'm so happy we managed to pack all this information in so little time. Um, and I know we have five minutes for the Q&A. So I'll ask one question and see how it goes. You might be the only one uh, or we might have time for more. Um, so very interesting to hear all the different perspectives and um, different levels of solutions that are being built. Um, and I guess maybe a question to all, um, and if you can be as succinct as possible, um, you know, I think 
uh, in all your presentations as well, we sort of speak a lot about the differences and opportunities that Web3 can generate compared to Web2. Um, but also what we try to do within the report that we launched is that actually there are differences amongst Web3 applications and there's different ways to develop the Web3 applications for nature markets. And so my question is for you, what are the two most important aspects we should be aware of uh, when building Web3 applications specifically for nature markets? Um, just to give a flavor to the audience uh, of what they are. Um, Fred, do you want to go first? We're happy to. So I think the difficulty here is to build a system that is quite, I would say, non-flexible uh, in, in a way that it will be flexible. What I mean by that is that we you basically building with Web3 comes down to coding smart contracts, you know, things that are not so easy to change or might require some some time and energy to change. Um, so I think for us, at least, the, the, when we started the product was to, th to, to think about how to build a smart contract or build something in the back end that could be eventually changed or adapted because things will need to be changed and adapted over the long term uh, because the community will see, will have different needs or different things they want to see so i think that's kind of the big challenge in building a system that will be performing for for the long term mm, very interesting thank you so how adaptable uh the solution is as nature markets develop um francisco uh i wonder the the conversations that you have with, with region like what is important for you to embed within the solution that you're building with them um in the platform yeah well one of the things is that all of the information is publicly available for your review and for anyone's review. Um, that's that's really important because, as you mentioned, I mean, there are different ways of using the technology and, and coming to different solutions. Um, but but many of the actors today are are, you know, are, are doing it behind closed doors and and. You, you can't actually see how it's evolving for us for us this is really really important because um as as fred mentioned it's not only about what you have today but how this will evolve in the future and how are you able to to think you no know, if you have 30 year projects this this is this is probably going to change in in 10 years and um, just the fact that everything's publicly available, that you understand the possibilities of uh, interconnecting different technologies and that you, you actually can uh, think towards the future, that's super important for us. Amazing, thank you. And Hania, we have one minute, uh, but I would really like to listen to your thoughts on this. Thanks, Constantina. So I think in short for us, it's most important that we invest in um, the infrastructure. Um, the reason for that is to bring the costs down for builders. Um, eventually, it's, it's very costly and uh, time intensive mm -hmm. in order to build this type of infrastructure. And we want to make sure that we enable the back end in order to have organizations like, for example, Terrasos or any other organization to have a reliable infrastructure to build their applications and their front end um, upon and make sure that um, uh, we have that um, in our ecosystem. And I think secondly as well, is often what you see is that there are uh, organizations building on islands where they have one part of the solution, but not the next part of the solution. And often you need to get from A to B to C. Um, and that's where we come in uh, is making sure that you can get on the train and get to all of the destinations that you need to be um, um, and not get stuck on your island. Amazing. Thank you so much. We're just on time. Please go and check the report, um, very interesting. And I hope we can continue this dialogue on this very important topic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, cheers. Thank you.